This message is coming to you from Holiness Revival Ministry Worldwide, also known as Holiness Revival Movement Worldwide. Listen attentively as Pastor Paul Ricker, the International Director of the Movement, ministers to you in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You will surely be blessed. Our Father, we are asking that grace will follow the revelation of your word and that transformation will come to our lives in Jesus' name. We bless you, Lord Divine. Touch us with the touch of the cross and let us be completely yielded unto the Lord that your will will be done in our lives, done in the church, done in our environment, done in our ministry, done everywhere in the world in Jesus' name. Thank you for answering our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We shall consider the selfless life. The selfless life. In my private Bible study, I came at the account of David's dealing with his son Absalom. I saw the tender and merciful heart of David. How he manifested this towards Absalom, even when Absalom overthrew him and sought his life. I saw clearly the selfless life of David. Then my mind ran through the Bible for such display of selflessness. In our message, we shall consider the selfless life of seven Bible characters. According to my finding, my study is wonderful. The selfless life is the true Christian spirit and should be our permanent lifestyle, permanent character, permanent Christian spirit, completely selfless in your life. Nothing is done to promote self, to advance self, to receive praise for self. You don't resist, you don't refuse to suffer. Say, I don't want to suffer. I don't want anybody to oppress me. I don't want anybody to do this, do this against me. No. The selfless life. Such is a life completely yielded before God. Yielded unto God. I look at that life and I see real Christianity. What God really wants to achieve in man. What God wants to achieve in his followers. It is the perfection the believers are called unto. Be completely selfless. We are now going to consider the selfless life of Abraham. Selfless completely. In the book of Genesis, chapter 13, verse 5 to verse 7. Genesis, chapter 13, verse 5 to verse 7. The Bible tells us, please, 5 to 17. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks, and hearts, and tents, and the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the hard men of Abram's cattle, and the hard men of Lord's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lord, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my, my hard men and thy hard men, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou 
depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves, the one from the other. Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Just to stop in verse 13, meanwhile. You see, Abraham brought up Lot. Abraham was the father to Lot because he was an uncle to him. So, clearly the wealth of Lot came from Abraham. A time came, there was a strife between the heart men of Lot and that of Abraham. And Abraham said unto Lot, my, my son, my brother, we are brothers. Let there be no strife among us. Let them, we, be, we are people of God. Let there be no strife. Quarreling, striving among us. Now, since you have much kettle, as I have much kettle, let's separate ourselves. Let there be no trouble. Now, choose. Where do you want to go? Which part of the land do you want? If you move to the right, then I take the left. If you choose the left is better for you, I take the right. That's the selfless life. He gave the better option to Lot. You choose whatever you want. That's the selfless life. In fact, it's as if two people were eating together and with two pieces of meat. One smaller than the other. And this selfless man told the other, take the big one. Take the big one. Everybody will normally want the better thing for himself. The prosperous thing for himself. The thing that will give him ease, joy, pleasure, satisfaction for himself. But the selfless, selfless life says, no, not for yourself. Give the chance to another person. Let him take the better one. And Lord shot the life of self here. He had to inspect and look for the place that was better. Well watered with all the good vegetation as the garden of Eden. That's the choice of Lord. Abraham shot the selfless life by giving out the best. Take whatever you want. Lord shot the selfish life of taking the best actually. But we have handled the self selfish life in the former study. We are not talking about the selfless life. Which is the way we are to go. Giving the other the best. Allowing him to have the chance of the best. Not struggling to satisfy self. To promote self. Then what happens? When Lord had chosen that, taking the base portion in verse 14, and the Lord said unto Abraham, After that Lord had separated from him, lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. So that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it, and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abraham removed the tent, and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Now, Lord had gone. When Lord now left Abraham, the most important thing is to secure righteousness, not material things. Get righteousness. These strivings will affect righteousness and affect the oppression of God in your life. These envyings and debates and struggles will affect the move of God. Get righteousness. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All other things shall be added unto you. Now, Abraham said, Lord, take the best. Take anyone. Take it. When Lord now made his choice, which direction actually did Lord follow? The Lord came to say, Abraham, look to the east, to the north, to the south, and to the west. Look round about. Whichever direction Lord went through. Abraham, I have given everywhere to you. Look to every place. I have given to you. You know, Abraham, there's a risk 
in this selfless life. God had called Abraham and told him clearly he was going to give him. Take him to a land he would bless him. Of course, God would give him this land of Canaan. Would there not have been risk if Lord, to give Lord all that chance? What if Lord takes away that? No. If you are doing righteousness by God, God will guide your life. That which he wants to give you, nobody will take it away. Just do your righteousness. Do, take the risk of righteousness. Even as if here is that which belongs to me, somebody can take it. Oh, can you take it? He will not take it. If he takes it, he will give it back to you. Because it's of God that it should be given to you. Whoever will save his life will lose it. But he that will lose his life for my sake and the gospels shall find it. If you will make struggles, carnal struggles, you will miss the blessings of God. But if you allow things to go, if you will be the one to be bearing it, if you will be the one to be suffering loss, God will back you up and bless your life. This should be your principle in the family, in the church, in your working place, in the society. Now, let's go to the, self, the second one, the selfless life of Joseph. A life not struggling to for itself, but allowing it go. You will have everything back again. Selfless, no, but let's look, watch something yet more. This Abraham, in the book of Genesis, chapter 22, wants us to consider something here. You know, we have reading to do about this life of Abraham. Genesis chapter 22. I read verse 1 to 18. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and, give, and, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him therefore a bond offering, Upon one of the mountains, which I will take, tell thee of. What co a costly commandment. Costly. Ishmael was not with Abraham at this time. He had gone. Lovely child. Oh, the promised child. The gift of God. But see the challenge. Go and sacrifice him. The Lord wants to test you. Are you selfless? Oh, you say, God, I will become ashamed. How will I live without child? God, I will become ashamed. How will this one, how, how will this become of me? What will people say? Are you going to bother nothing of what people will say? Let them say whatever they say. That God's will should be done in my life. So, and Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him. And Isaac, his son, and cleft the wood for the bond offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then, on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the earth, and I and the Lord will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the bond offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand, and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamp for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamp for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. It was not a joke. Ready. Abraham didn't live to himself. If God gave me this and wants it back, go. But one thing I know, God will fulfill his promise. God is not a man that he shall lie. Therefore, I'm not going to struggle over this. If God wants the money, let the money go. If God wants this property, let the property go. If God wants this, if he wants me, whatever he wants. In fact, if God means I should die, let me die. Is my life mine? So, that's the selfless life. 
That's how God wants us to be. The point He wants you to stay, to stand, the place He wants you to remain and dwell there. Where self, no self defense, no self struggle, no self protection, no self, no self. No, no, no. Completely yielded to God. So He took the knife and was ready to chew the child. Then, ready to slay the child. It was at that time. At that time. The Bible says, and the, verse 11, And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He has said the Lord had to call very fast because the man was busy, was ready to chew, was ready to slay. He was called, the Lord called him, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I, ever ready to do your will. To go where you want me to go. To suffer loss for your name's sake. Ever ready to obey. And the Lord said, Lay not thine hand upon the, the Lord, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know, and I'm going to declare to the world your selfless life, completely married to the Lord, to do his will. Now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a ticket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the state of his son. And Abraham called the name of that, of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. But you only see it at the point of total consecration, total guiltedness. Where there is no fear, it is counted as it has been done. Counted that it has been settled. You have gone. You have done it. It is at that point of total loss. The loss is completed in the heart. The sacrifice is completed in the heart. At that point, you will see that there is a way by the way. God didn't mean to hurt you by the way. It's at the point of sacrifice you see sweetness. You see honey out of the rock. That's what we're saying. Let your Christian life take you to that point. That you are not afraid. God, I, my, I'm putting my leg in that water now. The water may carry me away. God, did he say you should do it? Go in. It's as you go in, you will see the miracle. So, then, see the blessing that followed. In verse 15. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time. And said, by myself have I sworn, said the Lord. For because thou hast done this. And hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee. And in multiplying I will multiply thy seed. As the stars of the heaven, and as the sun which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Because thou hast obeyed my voice. Please don't fear. Go with God at the point of total consecration. Don't defend yourself. Don't run away from suffering. Follow Him where He is asking you to go. Do exactly what He wants you to do. Although the promise may be that you are going to perish there. Why? Did you create your body? Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. But a body hast thou prepared me. If you have brought me to kill me here, thy will be done. So, at that point... You will be seeing advancement and glory and promotion and the blessing of our God. Let's be perfect before our God. Now, point, uh, the next one, the selfless life of Joseph. The selfless life, look at it in Genesis chapter 37, verse 4. Genesis chapter 37, verse 4. And we, his brethren, saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren. They hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. In verse 8. And his brethren said to him, Shall thou indeed reign over us? Or shall thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his ways. In verse 11 to 17. And his brethren envied him. But his father observed the saying. And his brethren went to feed their father's flock in, she in Shechem. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed their flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here am I. He's not afraid. Father, those people hate me. 
Those people, you know, they don't want to speak to me. They don't want to see me. God, no, my father said I should go. To see the welfare of my brethren, I am going. Am I going to bother about the hatred of anybody? Am I going to be afraid? Am I going to run away? Am I going to be angry? Am I? No. Here am I. I'm not considering the difficult situation facing me. Where you're sending me to. What you're asking me to do. What the man will say. The abuse that man will give me. I, I, I should be abused. To obey my father I'm going. And because he also loves his brother. Now look at it. In, I have, in that's chapter 37. Let's read in verse 14. And he said unto him, Go, I pray thee, get, see whether it be well with thy brethren, and well with the flocks, and bring me what again. So he went, um, so he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem, and a certain man found him. And behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, they are departed hence, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. He went after. It is it, painful, but he needed their welfare. He loved them. He, he wanted to go and see their welfare. He wanted to communicate the Father's love to them. The Father's care to them. That's the, the life God wants. You're not threatened by your enemy. And always wanting to avoid. Why? They will abuse you. Can't they abuse you? Ah, because they will hurt you. Why are you refusing hurt? So that you can obey God. Live the selfless life. Now, look at it. We're still seeing it. This selfless life. In chapter 45, verse 3 to 14. Genesis chapter 45, verse 3. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. They went to see Joseph magnified, glorified in Egypt, highly exalted in Egypt. See him introducing himself to his brethren. Can you see the humility there? And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I, am, I pray thee. I beg you, come near to me. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Now therefore, be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves, that ye sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years had the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be earring nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Haste ye, and go up to my father, and say unto him, Thus seeth thy son Joseph, God hath made me lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not, and thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, and thou shalt be near unto me, thou and thy children, and thy children's children, and thy flocks, and thy hearts, and all that thou hast, and there I will nourish thee. For yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household, and all that thou hast come to poverty. And behold, your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin, that it is my mouth that speaketh unto thee, speaketh unto you. And ye shall tell my father all my glory in Egypt, and of all that ye have seen, and ye shall taste and bring down my father hither. And he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck, and wept, and Benjamin wept upon his neck. Moreover, he, he kissed all his brethren, and wept upon them. And after that, his brethren talked with him. Praise the Lord. Joseph said, don't worry my brothers, that you sold me to Egypt. It's God that brought me here. I don't want you to make, I don't want to make you guilty. No, it's God that brought me here. It's God that led me here. If there were somebody, he would want to frustrate them, terrorize them, oppress them, and torture them, and make them feel guilty, and feel bad, and feel nothing. No. He said, come closer, come closer. That's the life of God. It's God that sent me here. You were doing it, but don't worry, it was God that was really doing it. It was a hard thing you were doing against me. But I've seen the advantage. I look clearly it's God. Selfless life. So, 
as he blessed his bread, they spoke well. The brethren drew closer, drew near unto him. Selfless life. He said, I'm going to nourish you. I'm going to care for your life. I'm going to protect your life. I'm going to take care of you and your children and your children's children, your cattle. I'm going to make life convenient. If you look at it in chapter 50, verse 18 to 21, let's look at it. Verse 18 to 21. And his breathing also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be thy servant. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore, fear ye not. I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. May God grant us this spirit of Christianity. That our enemies, because they did something against us, they're even feeling guilty now, they, that we try to look at them, try to wrestle that. Oh, maybe God promoted us to say, uh-huh. uh, yes, you were laughing at me before. Why are you not laughing at me before? Why are you not the one? See me now. No, not that, not that, not that. Humble. In whatever promotion God gave you. Humble. In whatever situation, whatever you come to have in life. So much that even those that were challenging you, those that were laughing at you, will feel still peaceful and welcome. That's the selfless life. Now we are going to consider the selfless life of Rahab. The selfless life of Rahab. In the book of Joshua chapter 2, we read verse 8 to verse 13. Joshua chapter 2, verse 8 to verse 13. The Bible tells us saying, because now Rahab God, Rahab came at opportunity to be saved from destruction and death. And when she got that opportunity, she felt it is not for high alone. It was not for high alone. Some ah, my people too need to be saved. My father too needs to be saved. My mother too needs to be saved. Am I the only one that will come out of this place when I have my people? No. She sought opportunity to get her entire father's house saved. And this is a selfless life. Look at it. In Joshua chapter 2, verse 8, the Bible tells us, And before they were laid down, she came up unto them, upon the roof. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land. And that your terror is falling upon us. And that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you. When ye came out of Egypt. And what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites. That were on the other side Jordan. Sihon and Og. Whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things. Our hearts did, did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now therefore, I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have shewed you kindness, that ye will also shew kindness unto my father's house, and give me a true token, and that ye will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren, and my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from dead. Can you see? Save my people, my father. Counted them. He, she loved them. Good must come to them. This good cannot come to me alone. This good should not be mine alone. I've come at good and I keep quiet. The four lepers say we do not well. And ne- uh, not our brethren suffering over there. Even eating themselves. And we have come at treasures and food and deeds. And we keep quiet at this period of time. And because we are convenient. We don't bother of others. No. We do not well. That's what the Bible tells us. We do not well. So Rahab said, since I can be saved. I've got the people of God here. I must think of my people. They too must be saved. She started interceding. Are you thinking of your people concerning heaven? Have you got opportunity to go to heaven? Do you think about them? What you can do to make sure they also come in? Did you come at a very good Christian book? You read it and it blessed you. Do you think of another person? That this should not be yours alone. Did you hear a message on cassette? It transformed and brought revival to you. Did you think of another person? 
And that this message needs to go out. That's why we say, learn to have cases. Because you should think of somebody else that as it has done in your life, it shall also do in the life of this person. Have you got a way of overcoming sickness? Or overcoming problem? Overcoming difficulty? Do you think of other people too? Or you're living for yourself? Once you're satisfied, that's okay. That's not the life of Christianity. The selfless life is the life that thinks of others, intercedes for others, wishes the, the, the prosperity, blessing of others as it is with you, so let it be with others. Look at it in chapter 6, verse 22 to 25. The selfless life of Rahab delivered his own, her own family. Verse 22. But Joshua said unto the two men that have spied out the country, go into the harlot's house and bring out thence the woman and all that she had. As ye swear unto her, and the young men that were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brethren and all that she had. And they brought out all her kindred and left them without the camp of Israel. And they burned the city with fire and all that was therein, only the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and of iron, they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. You can see, but Joshua saved Rahab, the harlot, and her father's household, and all that she had. And she dwelt in Israel, or even unto this day, unto the time of writing. Because she hid the messengers, which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. If by her selfless life of thinking of another, another really got saved. If we can be thinking of one another, we will be seeing the blessings of God flowing to people. If we can be selfless, God will use us to serve other people. If we're not thinking of our convenience, the salary we will end, the food we will eat, the car we will ride, the house we will live on. Why must we be in the bush? Why must we leave our country? Why must we leave the place of convenience? All because of me, my children, my family, my, 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 my. If we cannot be doing that and yield to God, others also will be saved. In the kingdom of God, we will see many people. If our money will not be just for ourselves, just to spend, to buy my days, to buy my days, we buy my days, and but we can be thinking to use our money to help, to, to bless others also, to do well to others, we will see many people saved. They will also come out of hell and also be in the kingdom of God. God wants this selfless life. By the way, the earth passes away and all that he has. It's that which is given unto the Lord that is treasurable. But some people think, if I give them all, how do I buy a car? If I give them all, how can this, if I take that, how can my children do this? If I can take that, the Bible says he that will lose his life for my sake shall find it. That which was given out will come back in a better way. Doesn't God think good of you? Will God want you to suffer without a reward? Will he not bless your life? Come to this selfless life. You will see God in your life. He left heaven and came to earth because of selflessness. If you can be selfless, then you are in company with him. And as he got glorified in, in life and back to the throne, you also will be glorified together with him. You will sit on the same throne with him. Now, we are going to consider, number four, the selfless life of Ruth. In the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verse 8 to 18. Ruth. Chapter 1, verse 8 to verse 18. The Bible tells us, saying, And now my sake unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as ye have, have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And now my say, Turn again, my daughters. Where will ye go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have an husband. If I should say, I have hope. If I should have an husband also tonight, and should also be a son, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Opa 
kissed her mother-in-law and said bye-bye to her. The situation is true. Clearly, there is no hope for her husband. There is no hope for anything. Husband, children, family life, nothing. It's true. And she accepted. Why? She was going back for her husband, for her household, for convenience of life. She was going back because she would not miss her mother and her father and her people, her land. But see, in, 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 see selflessness here. Selflessness. In the case of Ruth, as we shall read. In verse 16. And Ruth said, again, look, from verse 14. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Opa kissed her mother-in-law. But Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. And thy God, my God. Where thou diest, Will I die? And there will I be buried? The Lord do so to me. And more also, if aught but death part thee and me. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. Praise the Lord. Ruth said, is it not children you are talking about, mother-in-law? Is it not husband you are talking about? Is it not my land you are talking about? Is it not property, material thing? I have decided to love you and to stay with you. And I willingly forgo those things. I have agreed to remain unmarried through life. Just to be with you. Just to be with you. you will, I will be with you. Your people shall become my people. Your God shall be my own God. Where you die, there I will die. And there, they should not carry my dead body back home. Back to Moab. No, they should bury me there. Completely gilded. The selfless life. Completely. Then, look at it. In Ruth chapter 2, verse 11 to verse 12. When you give up like this, does God keep quiet? When you surrender, bind the sacrifice and lay it upon the altar, does God keep quiet? When you, you forgo the world and all the necessities of life, does God keep quiet? In verse 11 of Ruth chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been shewed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the date of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity. And had come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work. And a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel. Under whose wings thou art come to trust. This selfless life is the, is the, uh, the, is the example. Or the, 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 the selfless life are the examples that can bless the, the world. Quicken the world. Because people will know what you have done. What you, for, what you for wind for Christ. What you abandoned for Jesus. What you gave up. The things you will have enjoyed with, you refused to enjoy. Because of righteousness. Because of Jesus. The inconveniences you have endured. Because of Jesus. The testimony will go around. It will help to build up righteousness everywhere. And then he says, the Lord will recompense you. For this which you have done, you have given up husband, may God give you back one. You have given up these privileges of life, conveniences of life, may God give them to you. Selfless life. If God says stay in this place, will you stay? Or you want your convenience? If God says, oh, you want to go to school, abandon that. Do my work. You want to leave my work? Do my work. Will you leave it? If, the, if, if maybe sacrifice is demanded of you to do this, do this, do this, and it's costly, costing, costing you in money, costing you in this and in that, will you do it? If there should be losses in your life, will you endure? But that's the life that blesses. The life that does not seek his own. Charity seeketh not her own. That's the selfless life. The righteous life. That's the point the God of heaven is leading us to. He wants us to be there. That is holiness. Submission. 
perfection that God will. And now, when you come to that point of total surrender, is then all things will become yours. Oh, see this road. The Lord bless you. The Lord recompense you. Now, have you noticed in chapter 3? Um, notice how this same road gave birth to a wonderful child. God used, look at it, chapter 4, verse 13. So Boaz took root, and she was his wife. And when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception. And she bare a son. Root. So this selfless life is the way to your miracles. You have been married for, is it about 10 years? To your husband, there was no child. If, who knows now of Opa? Opa might still be in her barrenness. But it is this giving up all. See, Ruth, your answer has come. It is in selfless life you find salvation. You find miracle. You find progress. You find promotion. You find the blessings of life. See, Ruth had given birth to a child in verse 14. And the woman said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a king's man, that his name may be famous in Israel. And he called... Um, and, and he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life, and a nourisher of thine old age, for thy daughter-in-law. That precious woman that loved you so much. Give up everything just for your love, and because of your God. Thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. And now my took the child and laid it in her bosom, and became nurse unto it, and... The women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David, and we will add the father of Jesus after the flesh. Can you see, at the point of selflessness, can you see what comes? Can you see what grows out of the selfless life you live? Except a corn of wood falls down and dies. It abided alone. Falls down. Give up. It is in your giving up. You will get it all. If God has promised, you don't need to struggle for it. It will come. What I mean, don't mean you don't need to struggle. I mean, this carnal struggle. Eh? You want to take, oh, Jacob, you were wrong. God promised you. But why are you using tricks? Why are you using carnal wisdom? I said, it will not come. Can anybody snatch what God has given you? Why are you using carnal wisdom? It will come. But if you use carnal kind of wisdom, maybe you will have it, but you will have it bitterly. With frustration. It will almost kick you off. You may even backslide out of it. So, that's the selfless lie we're talking about. It is very rewarding. Come to the point you surrender all to God. Yield everything. Yield. Bow. I mean, get, I say, be buried completely. Be buried. Soak I and mean, sink into the water. Let not even your head be seen. But you will move. You will leave. You will swim. You will fly because God will use you. Praise the Lord. Now, we're going to see the selfless life of Jonathan. There's so much here about the life of Jonathan that people do not know. Jonathan, the son of King Saul. Jonathan, the friend of David. Look at it in the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 18, verse 1 to verse 4. Verse 4. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 1 to verse 4. The Bible tells us here saying, And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan was here to the throne, but he did not lay hold on it. No. He did not. Being found in fashion of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. That's the life of Jesus. But took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the fashion of a man. Equal with the father, but humbled down himself. Jonathan. See, we are going to consider the selfless life of Jonathan. In, verse, in chapter 19, verse 1 to 7. And Saul so spake to Jonathan his son, because Saul had become envious of David, was heart seeking after David to destroy him. And Saul so said to Jonathan his son, and to all his servants, that they should kill David. But Jonathan Saul's son delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, seeketh to kill thee. Now therefore, I pray thee, take heed to thyself until the morning, 
and abide in a secret place and hide thyself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where thou art, and I will commune with my father of thee. And what I see, that I will tell thee. And Jonathan spake good of David unto Saul his father, and said unto him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David. Because he hath not sinned against thee, and because his works have been to thee, were very good. For he did put his life in his hand, and slew the Philistine, and the Lord wrought a great salvation for all Israel. Thou sowest it, and didst rejoice, wherefore then will thou sin against innocent blood, to slay David without a cause? And Saul so hearkened unto the voice of Jonathan, and so swear, as the Lord liveth, he shall not be slain. And Jonathan then called David, and Jonathan shoot him all those things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was, his, he was in his presence as in times past. Can you see? Selfless. Saul's problem was envy. David was taking over the throne. But Jonathan never bothered about that. We're going to see. Selflessness. Where God is. Let's go there. Where God is. What God wants to do in any man. Let's support it. If it means we should come down from the throne, that another man should go there. Let's give God his chance. Didn't he create the world? Is it not to serve his own purpose? Should he not do his own will in his own church, in his, the world? Did not Jesus alone die on the cross? Should he not therefore have his will? Then, look at it, how Jonathan exemplified this. The selfless life of Jonathan. In chapter 20, verse 12 to 17, the Bible says, Verse 12, And Jonathan said unto David, O Lord God of Israel, when I have sounded my father about tomorrow, any time of the third day, I mean, or the third day, and behold, if there be good toward David, and I then say not unto thee, and she it thee, the Lord do so, and much more to Jonathan. But if it please my father to do thee evil, then I will shew it thee, and send thee away, that thou mayest go in peace. And the Lord be with thee, as he hath been with my father. You are going to be king. May God be with you when you come to the throne. The Lord be with you. And thou shalt not only while I live, while yet I live, show me the kindness of the Lord, that I die not, because the throne is coming to you. I could have joined my father to kill you because I need the throne. Never, 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 never. I support your going into the throne. But be merciful unto me. That's what he said in verse 15. But also thou shalt not cut off my, my kindness, thy kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord had cut off the enemies of David, every one from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, Let the Lord even require it at the hand of David's enemies. And Jonathan caused David to swear again because he loved him. For he loved him as he loved his own soul. The selfless life. Again, let's look at it in verse 27 to verse 34 of that same chapter. Verse 27. And it came to pass on the morrow, which was the second day of the month, that David's place was empty. And Saul said unto Jonathan his son, Wherefore cometh not the son of Jesse to meet, neither yesterday nor today, because Saul thought that was the right time to kill him. And Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked leave of me to go to Bethlehem. And he said, Let me go, I pray thee, for our family had a sacrifice in the city. And my brother, he had commanded me to be there. And now, if I have found favor in thine eyes, let me get away, I pray thee, and see my brethren. Therefore, he cometh not unto the king's table. Jonathan said, David took permission from me. That he was traveling home for an important sacrifice. That's why he is not here. Now see verse 30. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. And he said unto him, Thou son of the perverse rebellious woman. Do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion. And unto the confusion of thy mother's nakedness. For as long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the earth, thou shalt not be established, nor thy kingdom. 
Wherefore now, say and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. And Jonathan answered Saul his father, and said unto him, Wherefore shall he be, be slain? What has he done? And Saul cast a javelin at him, to smite him. Whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to slay David. Can you see? The throne was to be J- J- Jonathan's. And the father was protect, struggling for him. But Jonathan didn't bother. The Lord has given it to David. I bow for him. I submit to him the selfless life. The Lord has called him. The Lord has anointed him. The Lord has appointed him. He has made him a leader over me. An overseer over me. Therefore, I submit. It, it, I could have been there. They asked me to come down so he could take over. Amen. I submit. Praise the Lord. That's the selfless life. A rewarding life. Sure, you should think Jonathan is in heaven. By this selfless life. Look at it again in chapter 23, verse 16 and 18. And Jonathan's soul son arose and went to David into the wood and strengthened his hand in God. Praise the Lord. David, hold your righteousness. And in verse 17, And he said unto him, Fear not, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find thee. And thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee. Praise the Lord. And I shall be next unto thee. And that also Saul my father knew it. Knew it. And the two made a covenant before the Lord, and David abode in the wood, and Jonathan went to his house. He said, don't be afraid. Trust in God. What God has said, he will do it. God has promised you the throne, he will do it. Whatever my father is doing, he will not succeed. My father knows that you will be the king, and I will be your assistant. Can you imagine that? And the, the throne was dead, Jonathan's. But he has given it to David. Why? That's the appointment of God. The world is the Lord's. The church belongs to Christ. Let's allow him to do what he wants to do in his church. Let's allow the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do. Let's not be stigmatized. Let's not be traditional. Let us not be selfish. Let us not be using ego. Let's not be pushing with our own flesh. We'll be blocking the way of the Lord. Please bow. What matters by the way? Is it not heaven? Lift the throne and you will go to heaven. Is that not the better thing? How many are on throne and don't eventually go to heaven? What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? The most important thing is heaven. God has given the throne to somebody. But the fact that you are not there doesn't hinder heaven. Therefore, bow. Submit. Be selfless. In your family also. Maybe God is using so, uh, uh, your younger brother. Using another person. A sister. Please accept it. Agree with him. The Lord is promoting him. Let the will of the Lord be done. Through him, the family members will be blessed. No envy. No jealousy, no frustration. That's the will of God, the selfless life. Now I'm going to talk to you, the selfless life of David. This was even the thing that motivated me into this message. As I read this man's selfless life. Look at it in Psalm, 1 Samuel chapter 26, verse 7 to 25. The Bible tells us here in verse 7. So David and Abishai came to the people by night. And behold, Saul lay sleeping within the trench. And his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster. But Abner and the people lay round about him. Then said Absalom, said Abishai to David, God had delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. Now therefore, let me smite him, I pray thee, with the spear even to the earth at once. And I will not smite him the second time. He will just die flat. And David said to Abishai, destroy him not. For who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said moreover, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him. Or his day shall come to die. Or he shall descend into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. But I pray thee, take thou now the spear that is at his bolster, and the cruise of water, and let us go. So David took the spear and the cruise of water from Saul's bolster, and they got them away. And no man saw it, nor knew it, neither I wept 
awaked, for they were all asleep, because a deep sleep from the Lord was falling upon them. Then David went over to the other side, and stood on the top of the hill, afar off, a great space being between them. And David cried to the people, and to Abner, the son of Nah, saying, Answerest thou not, Abner? Then Abner answered, and said, Who art thou that criest to the king? And David said to Abner, Art not thou a valiant man? And who is, like, who is like unto thee in Israel? Wherefore then hast thou not kept thy lord the king? For there came one of the people in, in to destroy the king thy lord. This thing is not good that thou hast done. As the lord liveth, ye are worthy to die, because ye have not kept your master, the lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is. And the cruise of water that was in his bolster. And Saul knew David's voice. And Saul say, and it said, Is this thy voice, my son David? And David said, It is my voice, my lord, O king. And he said, Wherefore doth my lord thus pursue after his servant? For what have I done? Or what evil is in my hand? Now therefore, I pray thee, Let my lord, the king, Hear the words of a servant. If the Lord have steered thee up against me, let him accept an offering. But if they be the children of men, cursed be they before the Lord. For they have driven me out this day from abiding in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go, suffer the gods. Now therefore, let not my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord. For the king of Israel is come out to seek a flea. As when one dog hunt a partridge in the mountains. Then, Saul, then, Saul, then said Saul, I have sinned. Return my son David. For I will no more do thee harm. Because my soul was precious in thine eyes this day. Behold, I have played the fool. And have erred exceedingly. And David answered and said, Behold, the king's spear, and let one of the young men come over and fetch it. The Lord render to every man his righteousness and faithfulness. For the Lord delivered thee into my hand today, but I would not stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. And behold, as thy life was much set by this day in my eyes, so let my life be much said by in the eyes of the Lord, and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. Then Saul said to David, Blessed be thou, my son David. Thou shalt both do greatly, great things, and shall still prevail. So David went on his way, and Saul returned to his place. The selfless life. Never. I won't kill him. I won't plan his plot. I, he's wicked. I know he has backslidden. I know he's, but I, it's not for me to think of I'm going to torture him because he's looking after my life. I've got opportunity now. I'm going to use this opportunity. Not the Christian life. Not the Christian life. David told Abisha, don't do it. Who can stretch forth his law, his son against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? He will die in old age. If God has promised me throne, I don't want to hasten it. It shall come in God's time. He, the promise has time attached. The promise has time attached. I can kill this man and still not make it. So please let him die in his time. Or go to war and die. Or God knows how to slay him. But not me. No, not me. That's the selfless life we are talking about. That God wants us to possess. You know, in another time, in chapter 24, verse 8 to 22. Chapter 24, verse 8. To 22, the Bible tells us, David also arose afterward and went out of the cave. Because they slept in the same cave with Saul. God protected David and cried after Saul, saying, My Lord the King. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. And David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou means words, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy heart. Behold this day, thine eyes have seen how that the Lord hath delivered thee today into my hand in the cave. 
and some bade me kill thee, but my eyes spared thee. And I said, I will not put forth my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see, yea, see the skirt of thy robe in my hand, a token that I really t- came close to you. For in, in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe, and kill thee not, no thou. And say that there is neither evil nor transgression in my hand. And I have not sinned against thee. Yet thou huntest my soul to take it. The Lord just between me and thee. And the Lord avenged of thee, uh, avenged me of thee. But my hand shall not be upon thee. As said the proverb of the ancient, Wickedness proceeded from the wicked, but my hand shall not be upon thee. After whom is the king of Israel come out? After whom dost thou pursue? After a dead dog like David. If, after a flea. A weakling like myself. The Lord therefore be judge and judge between me and thee. And see and plead my cause and deliver me out of thine hand. And it came to pass when David had made an end of speaking. This words unto Saul. And Saul said. Is this thy voice my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. And he said to David. Thou art more righteous than I. For thou hast rewarded me good. Whereas I have rewarded thee evil. And thou hast shewed this day, how that thou hast done well with me, for as when the Lord hath delivered me into thine hand, thou killest me not. For if a man find his enemy, will he let him go well away? Yes, so, if he's a selfless man, a righteous man, he will allow his enemy go, human enemy. Wherefore, the Lord reward thee good, so that thou hast done unto me this day. And now, behold, I know well that thou shalt surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in thine hand. Swear now therefore unto me, by the Lord, that thou wilt not cut off my house, my seed after me, and that thou wilt not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swore unto him. And so went home, and David and his men got them up unto the hold. Can you see? If a man finds his enemy, will he let him go? Yes. If that man is a righteous man. But we use our tongue to speak, to slander, to destroy. Why? We want to protect self. We will talk to this person. We will talk to that person. Why? We want to protect self, to magnify self. I am not guilty. I am like that. Is there no God in heaven to justify you? David, thank God you didn't kill Saul. You would have a problem in your kingdom. You would have a problem. When you sent and they killed Uriah, did you, were you free? The problem of Absalom, did you not come by that? Are there no repercussions in life? The selfless life is a life that guarantees from against repercussions. That's the selfless life. So, we see it in the book of Second Samuel. Let's look at it. Still the selfless life of this man David. And see, when King Saul died, Whoa. In Second Samuel. See how this man cried. Do you remember that David killed somebody because he killed Saul? Because, why did you kill the Lord's anointed? And then, see the lamentation of David. Second Samuel chapter 1, verse 17. And David lamented with, his, with, lam, with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan his son. Also, he bade them teach the children of Judah the use of bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Joseph. The beauty of Israel is slain upon thy high places. How are the mighty falling? Tell it not in God. Pursue and publish it not in the streets of Askelon. Let the daughters of the Philistines rejoice. Let the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. Ye mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew. Neither let there be rain upon you. No, no fields of, of offerings. For there the shield of the mighty is vilely cast away. The shield of Saul, as though he had not been, the Lord, been anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan, turn not, that, turn not back. And the sword, the sword of Saul, return not empty. Saul and Jonathan were lovely and pleasant in their lives. And in their dead, they were not divided. 
They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. Ye daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who had clothed you with, in scarlet, with, with, other, with other delights, who put on ornaments of gold upon your apparel. How are the mighty fallen in the midst of the battle? O Jonathan, thou wast slain in thy high places. I am distressed for thee. My brother Jonathan, very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. How are the mighty fallen and the weapons of war perished? The selfless lie. In the date of Saul, see the man crying. Saul was pleasant and lovely in his day. It's some people that deceived him. It's demons that confused him. Otherwise I know that man. Saul was lovely. Saul and Jonathan. You children of Israel cry for him. Saul brought gold to you. He dressed you in ornaments. Pray, cry and weep for the date of your king. A precious king. A goodly king to you. The selfless life. Totally free from pride. Rejoicing over your enemy. No, not, not David, not David, not David. That's the life of Christianity. That's the life. When I read this thing of David, I said, God, this is Christianity. That is the perfection of Christianity. Be, dwell in this selfless life. Yes, as the Lord revealed. Can you see other selfless life manifested by David? As you go through, look at in Second Samuel chapter 16, verse 5. Second Samuel chapter 16, we read verse 5. Five. When Absalom had taken over the throne and was running after David to kill him. And now David had run to the wilderness. There was war between David's men and Absalom's men. And see what David said in verse 5. And when King David came to Beth Bahurim, sorry, Second Samuel, I read chapter 16, verse 5 to 13. Oh, now I'm talking about another case of a man that abused David, apart from that of Absalom. I'm talking about the case of Shemaiah, a man that abused and cursed David. And look at verse 5. And when King David came to Bahurim, behold, there came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shemaiah, the son of Gerar. He came forth and trust and cursed and cursed, still as he came, and he cast stones at David and at all the servants of King David, and all the people, and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And thus said Shemaiah, when he cursed, come out, come out, thou bloody man, and thou man of Belial, the Lord hath returned unto thee, all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom unto the hand of Absalom thy son. And behold, thou art Taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. Then said Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, unto the king, Why should this date dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. And the king said, What have I to do with thee, ye sons of Zeruiah? So let him curse, because the lord hath said unto him, Curse David. Who shall then say, Wherefore? Wherefore hast thou done so? And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son, who cometh forth of my bowels, seeketh my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone, and let him curse, for the Lord hath bidden him. It may be that the Lord will look on mine affliction, and that the Lord will require me good for his cursing this day. And, and as David and his men went by the way, Shemaiah went on the hillside over against them and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and cast dust. And the king and all the people that were with him came weary and refreshed themselves there. Now, that, this man was cursing, raining some false things against David. Should he defend himself? Allow the matter. God knows the truth. Why bothering myself? God allowed him to curse. He would have not come to do that. God gave him permission. Well, allow him. Why do you say you go and kill him? Ah, kill him? Don't. Allow him to curse. Let him go ahead. Maybe God who knows my innocency and knows that this man is telling lies against me and knows that this man is seeking my trouble but I am not going after him. God might do me good for this cursing this day. Allow him to curse the selfless life. 
God protects that selfless life. God restored David back to kingship. Shemaiah came and bowed and said, Oh, have mercy on me. Don't put to heart what your servant did when he, was, he behaved mad to you. For I, when he was speaking out of sense. And somebody said, Let's kill him. David said, No, no, no. no. Can we kill people these days? No, no, no. That's the selfless life. And I pray God will give us the selfless life. Oh, I don't have time because I speak, I look at my time. I will talk about Absalom, who wanted to kill David. He took over the throne and wanted to kill David. And then David ran to the wilderness. And there was now war between the people of David and that of Absalom. David told Joab and, and told his own people. Everybody had it. Please deal well with Absalom for my sake. The boy is stubborn, but be patient with him. If you are able to get him, please. Keep him alive. So, in the battle, eventually Absalom was, de- was killed. When the, no- the news came to David, Oh, see David! As David cried, in the book of Second Samuel, chapter 18, I read verse 31 to 33. The Bible says, And behold, Cushai came, and Cushai said, Tidings, my lord the king, for the lord had avenged thee this day, of all them that rose up against thee. And the king said unto Cushai, Is the young man a Absalom safe? That's the first thing. And Cushai said, answered, The enemies of the Lord, the king, and all that rise against thee to do thee hard, be as that young man is. The man is dead. And the king was much moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and waved as he waved. Thus he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my, oh, my son Absalom, my son Absalom, would God I have died for thee? Oh, Absalom, my son. This is life. There's no, in, there was no plan to do wickedness. There was no thought of vengeance. In him, despite the evil of that person, no thought of vengeance. Oh, that I had died because of you. The selfless life. Because of time I ran up, the selfless life of John the Baptist. In the book of John, the selfless life of John the Baptist. You see, the account of John, the ministry of John. He, he, John's ministry was at the same time with that of Jesus Christ, when Jesus was on earth. But you know, John clearly declared to the people and said unto them, I am not he that is to come. I am not he. I am, in fact, the person that is coming, the, I am not even worthy to stoop down and unloose the latchet of his shoes. I am not worthy. He shot it clearly. Don't give me honor and think I am anybody. No, I'm here to glorify somebody. And then, you see, what happened in John chapter 3? John chapter 3, some people came to John and said, "Ah, We saw Jesus doing some great things. See how John answered them. Look at in verse 26. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, To whom thou bearest witness. Behold, the same baptized, and all men came to him. He's pulling crowd. And what did he say? John answered and said, A man can receive nothing, except it is given him from above. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the frame of the bridegroom, who standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy is fulfilled. I see him prospering in the ministry. That's my joy. God has given him the calling and the anointing. God has given him the grace. I see him prospering. The crowds are going to him. That's how I like it. That's my job. He said in verse 30, he must increase, but I must decrease. He will continue to make progress. He will prosper. But my ministry will be going down. His will be going up. God has called him and anointed him. I love the progress of his ministry. I love to hear him when he preaches. I love his wisdom. The anointing, the insight, the power, the illustrations. I love his boldness. Yes, I love the way he's doing it. I love the way he's succeeding in it. It's my joy. A selfless life. But they're fellow ministers together. If there were anybody, he would want to receive honor of me. He never sought it. He never accepted it. 
this selfless life. That's the life you should live. May God grant you that life. Let's rise up upon our feet and go before the Lord in prayer. That's the life. Live the selfless life among your brethren. The selfless life is the life that brings peace. It gives the Holy Spirit the opportunity to move in the church. It gives the brethren the largeness of space required to grow fast in the Christian, Christian life and ministry. Live this life in your family. Live it in the church. Live it in your workplace. And live this life in the society. You will enjoy a life of peace and divine blessing if you live this selfless life. Wonderful. The selfless life. You see it in Abraham? That's the life God promotes. Completely yielded to the Lord. Never wishing to be promoted above your fellows. Why? If God has promotion for somebody, let him receive it. You are ever ready to give up your throne for another. The selfless life. If that's the will of God. Don't live for yourself. Live for God. If God has given you calling, He will make a way for you. Don't struggle it. A man's gift, make it a way for him. Be ready to suffer for Christ. In your suffering, you will receive divine promotion. Oh, Ruth got her child at the point of selflessness. The miracle will come at the point of selflessness, at the altar of total consecration. Thy will be done. In your family, is somebody prospering there? Bless him. Encourage him. No envy and jealousy. Don't say, I will never partake of him so he will not be proud. I will not partake of his riches. He's giving you something. So no, no, don't, 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 don't. Why? Why? Be selfless completely. What if it were you? Should they treat you so? Enjoy one another. Promote one another. Let each esteem the other better than themselves. Selfless life between husbands and wives. Not trying to raise up yourself and force yourself up above your wife. No. God will give you naturally the headship of other family. Don't bully yourself through. Don't bully yourself through. Woman, don't resist that man, that man's authority, and say, uh uh, I want to show you that I am also. No! Be lost. Then your glory shall appear. Your glory will be seen in when you are lost, totally selfless, yielded to that man. Your preciousness will appear. Selfless life. We say Abraham's blessings are mine. Do we also claim Abraham's selfless life? Selfless life. In Jesus' name we pray. You have just listened to the man of God, Pastor Paul Ricker, the International Director of Holiness Revival Movement Worldwide, with headquarters in Abuja, Nigeria. Holiness Revival Movement Worldwide is a non-denominational ministry that is given to the propagation of Christ's righteousness and holiness in churches and nations of the world through crusades, revival meetings, production and spread of holiness literature and materials. For other messages and literature of the ministry, Contact 081-3635-6813 or 080-5683-4323 or email holinessrevivalmovement at gmail.com. Thank you.